So, shall we start, Moksha? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, it's seminar time again. Hello, everybody. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Moksha Madhiman. Moksha is on the faculty of the Department of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Delaware. After receiving his PhD at Brown, uh, he's been at, he was at Yale University before coming to the University of Delaware. Moksha also holds several affiliate or visiting appointments at the Tata Institute of Fund Fundamental Research in Bombay, at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, Institute of Math Mathematics and its Applications in Minneapolis, the Isaac Newton Institute for Math Sciences in Cambridge, and MSRI in Berkeley, to name a few. So Moksha loves to travel. Uh, Moksha's in research is at the intersection of uh, information theory and probability theory. And he has his fingers also in, in, in combinatorics, functional analysis, statistics, and physics. So in all these areas, he's truly a man for all seasons. Uh, speaking personally, Moksha's papers are all, have always been a joy to read and to learn from. They are full of rich nuggets as they develop basic wide-ranging mathematical techniques and reveal the interplay between different sets of uh, ideas. And they're beautifully written. So today's uh, Moksha's talk is on Rennie information inequalities and their significance. So Moksha, thank you, and it's, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Prakash, for the extremely uh, kind introduction. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is um, Rennie information measures and uh, their significance in mathematics in general. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll start out by very briefly mentioning, uh, you know, some information theoretic motivation for uh, looking at Rennie information measures. Uh, but I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And in any case, uh, this is not something that I personally have worked on that much in terms of operational significance of Rennie information measures and so on. And in fact, um, Amos, who I think is in the audience, uh, knows a lot more about this stuff. So um, uh, let's just start with the uh, basic definition of Rennie entropy. And very quickly, we are going to move into the continuous setting. But uh, for, you know, just uh, 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 to, to start with, I'll just start with the discrete setting, and then we'll jump to the continuous setting in a minute. So uh, the Rennie entropy of order alpha is defined in the following way. Um, is something that probably most people have seen. So, uh, so this is for for uh, p, which is a probability mass function. Let's say p1 to pm on an alphabet of size m. Um, and uh, this this definition works for uh, for alpha in zero one open interval union one to infinity. And then the limiting cases that are considered, uh, so for alpha equals zero, alpha equals one, and alpha equals infinity. Uh, so H zero of P is just, the, uh, is just the log of the support of P. So that's the set of I such that P I is positive. And H1 of P by taking the limit. And here, to take the limit properly as alpha goes to one, you have to use L'Hopital's rule, but that gives you the Shannon entropy. And H infinity of P. Um, well. Okay, so so all of these, so so one thing to note is that all of these, uh, so note, uh, all of these are measures of spread of the distribution, right? Um, are measures of spread or randomness uh, in the sense that, in the sense that. Um, the smaller that any one of these quantities is, the closer it is to something deterministic, right? If you're 
if your uh, if your maximum probability for example the maximal atom is very large then this is going to be very small so this is close to one this is very small and that's close to deterministic and a similar logic applies for for all of these notions so they are all in some sense a measure of spread or randomness but they of course they are different measures and there's a natural relationship between them which comes from holders inequality which is that uh, th there's a monotonicity property so um, uh, i mean so so as is as is typical in these contexts we interchangeably talk about probability mass functions and random variables um, so uh, right so this is non increasing the the randy entropy so okay so um uh this is fine i mean they're all measures of spread but why are they interesting so i'm just going to very briefly mention uh, operational significance of any entropies and uh, the uh, so so uh, so oh, so so before i say that i should say that you know the sort of zeroth zeroth order reason that that uh, you know that reni introduced these notions came from an axiomatic framework so axiomatic uh, reasons so so for example if you you know if you are interested in measures of spread that satisfy various postulates right so so various natural postulates uh, uh, for for some uh, you know if you're interested in some functional uh, let's say uh, i don't know s which goes from the simplex to the non negative reals um, that measures spread of a distribution uh, that that leads to uh, these reni entropies right so so that was reni's original reason for introducing these uh, these quantities in the early 60s um but then the operational significance the first operational significance was developed soon after by campbell in 1965 and he observed that whereas uh, if, if you look at lossless source coding uh and uh, so so as we know if you are interested in minimizing the expected code length um uh you know so so where where l is uh code length code length function of a uniquely decodable code uh that leads to the entropy right so once again i'm interchangeably talking about so if x is has distribution p then i write entropy of x for entropy of p of course and so minimizing the expected code length over all uniquely decodable codes uh then then uh, essentially i mean if we if we ignore um integer constraints or if we take an asymptotic framework then that's essentially the entropy and uh, so so analogous to that campbell observed that instead of if we use um instead of using the expected code length if we use the moment generating function of the code length so if we use for example 1 over t expected value of e to the t l of x as our figure of merit right if this is what we want to minimize to be minimize uh then we get uh h alpha of x for alpha equals 1 over 1 plus t so this gives us an operational interpretation for uh for for reni entropies when alpha is between 0 and 1 right and uh um and then there were other um uh, uh other ways in which uh, the significance of reni entropy was understood as well so so again soon after gallagher in 1968 uh observed that if you consider uh, epsilon m codes uh by which by which we mean again this is um, 
well, this is just source coding. So, so we are looking at uh, fixed code words of fixed length. So, so here we look at code words of fixed length instead of variable length. So code words of fixed length, uh, let's say log m to the base two uh, um, in bits uh, with the probability of correct decoding being at least one minus epsilon. Uh, then Gallagher observed that epsilon m codes exist Uh, provided the following inequality holds uh, that log m to the base two is greater than or equal to h alpha x plus alpha over one minus alpha um, for some alpha in half one. And um, one nice thing about this is this is a sort of uh, finite block length uh, bound if you wish. And then if you are a one shot uh, situation, um, uh, but, but in the IID case, uh, uh, you, you can take M to be two to the NR. And then basically uh, by dividing by N, we get that R is greater than or equal to. So the thing is when you, when you take, when you take two to the NR here and then you divide by N, um, you know, this, this second term here, uh, this term here gets divided by N and it goes away. So what you're left with is the first term. And so you can take the limit as alpha goes to one because that gives you the, the uh, uh, best bound. And that, that way you recover, so it recovers, uh, you know, Shannon's theorem. So, um, so, so, so this, was, this was another, way in which uh, Rennie entropy shows up. And then finally, uh, Ari Khan in 96 observed that uh, Rennie entropies also show up when you, when you're dealing with guessing. So, um, so I can describe this later if there's interest, but, but I think that's, that's enough to say for now. So anyway, there are various operational interpretations of uh, Rennie entropy. Um, uh, and then there are also related notions of divergence, uh, just the same way that uh, relative entropy is a relative notion of entropy. So uh, Rennie divergences. Um, so once again, for alpha in zero one union one infinity, uh, the alpha PQ and uh, as before, uh, we can note the limiting cases. So, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to bother to write down all of them, but the, the important one is D1 of PQ is just the usual relative entropy, which is okay. And the second is that again, we have a monotonicity property. So, uh, Okay, um, uh, so, so there's a very nice review of Rennie divergences uh, in this paper by Van Erwin and Haramos uh, in 2014. And uh, if people are interested, I recommend this, uh, this survey. Um, so, so there's also operational significance of these quantities, for example, in hypothesis testing and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to say too much more about these. Um, so, so there's also uh, uh, interest in um, corresponding notions of mutual information. And there things get a little interesting uh, because it's not, not entirely obvious how to define um, uh, 
the right Rennie notion of mutual information. And um, uh, so, yeah, so there's, um, uh, so, so there are various notions that come up and uh, so notions, mutual information. Um, and uh, I mean, so, all right, so the, the, um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, so, so I guess, uh, you know, let me just, uh, Yeah, I'm just uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm just going to write down some definitions. So uh, so so there's there are three notions that are particularly interesting. And all of these are conveniently written in terms of Rennie divergences. So, so for example, uh, this one uh, is the minimum over all um, uh, uh, basically, if you look at D alpha, you look at the joint distribution of X, Y, and then you look at all product measures. So, um, so you take here, Know, all product measures on the corresponding alphabets. Uh, and similarly here, uh, so this is not symmetric. So, um, uh, yeah. And then, All right, so um, I mean, basically uh, all of these collapse, so all these collapse to the usual mutual information. Which is just the relative entropy between PXY and PX product PY when alpha equals one. Uh, but each of these have different operational significances. And uh, in order to look at, uh, in order to, you know, look at those, this is a long story, which I'm not going to go into, but I recommend various papers of, uh, of Lapidoth and Pfister uh, uh, in recent years, which, uh, which review uh, which review these, um, uh, you know, various operational significances of, uh, of, of these notions and in particular J alpha. So, all right. So, um, so at this point, I mean, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, uh, the Rennie entropy, but I just wanted to mention these other notions uh, since they're also uh, important. Um, so, um, so a first observation, is that um, uh, is that the uh, so okay so so why are these uh, I mean naively speaking 
uh, why should these notions be of interest to mathematicians and not just to information theorists? Well, one obvious reason comes from the fact that, uh, well, if we look at the continuous situation now, so continuous uh, setting, then the, then the only change is that now we are looking at random vectors with densities, let's say X with some density F on Rn, and then we are going to talk about the differential Renyi entropy, if you like, uh, which is just um, uh, which is just one over one minus alpha, the log of the integral of f of x to the alpha. And uh, once again, this is the formula for this range, and then h zero is the log. Now it's the volume of the support, uh, H1 is just the Shannon differential entropy. And uh, so, so just as a reminder, the infinity norm is the essential supremum of f of x. Right. So, um, so, so, so. Anyway, the the point is that um, that these are also measures of spread. But, but of course, in this case, so note that in this case, uh, instead of being non-negative, these h alphas in general can take values between minus infinity and plus infinity. So, um, uh, just like the Shannon differential entropy. Right, so um, uh, so so one obvious reason um, for the for the usefulness of these notions in uh, in mathematics comes from the fact that we can just rewrite the definition of H alpha in the following way. These are just L alpha norms, right? If we just uh, take the um, uh, right. So, so if we just uh, we just need to raise this here to the one over alpha to get a to get an L alpha norm. So this here, this is just the L alpha norm of f, which is right. So uh, of course, L alpha norms or LP norms are ubiquitous in uh, in analysis, and therefore it's natural that. Uh, that, for example, inequalities having to do with LP norms, you know, have natural restatements in terms of Rennie entropies and so on. So this is just a matter of translation. But um, what's, I mean, one thing that's interesting is that because of the particular way that Rennie entropies are defined, because of this normalization here with the log and the one over one minus alpha, uh, instead of the L1 norm, when you take alpha going to one, you don't get the L1 norm. Instead, you get the Shannon differential entropy, right? So this somehow interpolates nicely um, uh, between these different measures of spread of uh, probability density functions um, uh, in, in such a way that, you, so, so, you know, instead of, um, so, so in some sense, um, Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the right way to think about this is the following. So, um, so there's, there's, this, there's this dictionary that, that one can uh, develop between different categories of objects. Um, uh, so, so, so the first category I'm going to consider is sets and the study of, you know, sets in, in this context is geometry. So in particular, convex geometry. Uh, the second category I'm going to consider is functions. Uh, so I guess you could say analysis. And the third category is probability measures. And here you could say probability. Okay, so, so what's the dictionary here? So uh, 
so there's a way to embed a set in the space of functions or in the space of probability measures, right? So what's the natural way to embed a set in the space of functions? Well, you can look at the characteristic function of a set, right? The indicator function of a set. So this is just one if, if x is in A and zero if x is not in A. So that's a way you can embed any set into, the space, into a space of functions. And what's a natural way to embed a set? Uh, I mean, so, so let's, let's consider for now compact sets, okay, for, for, uh, for convenience. So, so then if we want to uh, embed that in the space of probability measures, the natural thing to do is to consider the uniform measure on A, right? So, um, and let's think for now, I mean, these, this, this kind of dictionary actually works in greater generality, but for now we are just thinking of our ambient space as being Rn. Euclidean space. So, um, uh, so, so then for, for, set, uh, for sets, a natural measure of um, uh, size of a set is the volume. So which will denote by volume sub n if I want to make the dependence on dimension explicit or many times I'll just write mod a, but that's, that's going to denote volume. And the, the corresponding um, uh, notion in the space of functions is just the integral. So for a function f, you can just look at the integral of f over rn, so note, that if you look at the integral of the indicator function of a set over Rn, you just get the volume of A, right? So this is a, this is a natural extension of volume to the space of functions in such a way that you recover the volume of a set when you look at the natural embedding. And on the other hand, for probability measures, the, the dictionary, it's, it's not entirely, it's not an exact dictionary, this is a rough dictionary, but the, but the uh, right analog here is the entropy. More generally, one can look at uh, Rennie entropies, but for now, let's just look at Shannon entropy. So the, the entropy of, of X if for, a, for, a, for a random vector X. Uh, and note that the entropy of the uniform measure on A uh, is just the log of the volume of A. So maybe one should think about the exponential of the entropy or something if one wants to get exactly the volume. But, you know, uh, the exponential function is monotonically increasing, so we'll just stick with the entropy for now. Um, okay, so um, in the geometry of sets, uh, there's, there's a very natural operation which comes from the fact that you know, we are looking at sets in a vector space, namely Rn. And because we are looking at subsets of a vector space, one has available to us the operation of addition of vectors. And that gives rise to a natural operation involving sets, which is the Minkowski sum operation. And the Minkowski sum of two sets is just the set of all x plus y such that x is in A and y is in B. Right, so um, uh, so um, yeah, so so we'll look at this operation. So this is called Minkowski summation, and I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll mention some examples in a minute so that it becomes clearer, you know, what this operation looks like when you consider various kinds of sets. But, but for now, let's just look at this definition as it is. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's worth looking at, looking at an example. So I'll just, I'll just draw some examples here and then we can uh, get rid of them if needed. So suppose this is one of my sets and this is the other, right? So this is, we are looking here in R2 and um, uh, Right, so this is this is my set A. This is my set B. So in this case, 
A plus B, we are going to be adding up every vector in, on one of these lines and every vector on one of these lines. So basically, you're going to get this square. Right? If this is if this is the origin here, you're going to get the square. If this is not the origin, you're going to get a square that's positioned somewhere else. It's just going to be a translation of a square. Right? But if this is the origin, then you're just going to get the square. Okay? And this, so this is going to be A plus B. On the other hand, if you take something like uh, you know, if you if you're if you're set A, um, if your set A uh, is this, and your set B uh, is this, let's say, um, uh, then uh, then the set A plus B is basically going to look like, I mean, it's going to look like a slightly it's going to look like a slightly bigger version of this with with rounded edges right and so on so so these are a couple of examples of minkowski summation uh, but uh, so so it should be clear what this operation is doing right so what's the corresponding operation for functions it turns out that the corresponding operation on functions um, is is um, uh, is something called inf convolution. So uh, I don't want to use the convolution symbol. So let's see. Okay, I'm not very good at drawing different kinds of stars, but uh, maybe I call it f hash g. Um, uh, so yeah, so we want to look at the supremum, uh, um, let's say x1 plus x2 equals x, f of x1, g of x2. Okay, and one thing to note is that if you look at this operation, this is called the inf convolution. Uh, if you look at this oper or the soup convolution rather, so if you look at this operation and you apply it to two indicator functions, you will get exactly the indicator function of A plus B. Okay, it's a simple exercise. Um, so what's the corresponding operation for probability measures? Well, for probability measures, it's going to be convolution or if you're looking at it at the level of random vectors or random variables, it's going to be just addition, right? So, um, uh, so, so note that if, you know, if X is uniform on A and Y is uniform on B, then X plus Y, it's not going to be uniform on A plus B, but it's certainly supported. X plus Y is supported on A plus B if, X is supported on A and Y on B, right? So um, are there any questions about this dictionary? Is this making sense? I think it's fine. Okay. Um, so, okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so, Right. So, um, yeah, let's let's leave this dictionary here for 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 now. And the the, the reason I started talking about this was the following: that uh, this leads us to to um, a particularly nice way in which Rennie entropies, you know, connect to all of these um, uh, notions. So. Um, so in, in, uh, in geometry, we have a basic inequality, uh, which is the Brun Minkowski inequality. Uh, and that says the following: that if if uh, if A and B are non-empty subsets of R n, 
to be precise, Borel subsets of Rn. Then the volume of A plus B to the one over N Um, okay, so why is this interesting? This is, this is interesting because one uh, immediate implication of this is the isoperimetric inequality. So, um, so the isoperimetric inequality says that if you fix, um, if you fix the volume of a nice set. I'm going to explain what nice means. Uh, then the surface area of the set, so of a nice set A, then the surface area of a set, which is defined as the limit as epsilon goes to zero, So I'll, I'll explain this in a minute, uh, is, is minimized by the Euclidean ball of that volume. Okay, so, so what is this saying? So, um, uh, so, so, you know, if you have, any set A, then this A plus epsilon times B2N, so B2N is just the Euclidean ball. So B2N is just the set of X and Rn such that uh, the Euclidean norm, the two norm, if you like, that's why the two uh, is less than or equal to one. So that just, uh, you know, that's like we, like we discussed before, that sort of, you know, rounds rounds the corners, but otherwise expands the set. Okay, a little bit. I mean, what you're basically doing is you're looking at all points which are within distance epsilon of your set, right? So, so A plus epsilon B two N is basically the set of all points uh, within distance epsilon of A. Okay, uh, so it's a fattening or thickening of the set A. And so what this is basically saying is that if you slightly uh, thicken the set, what is the rate of change of the volume, right? And that's, that's exactly, that's one way of defining the surface area of the set, that it's the rate at which the volume changes when you slightly thicken the set. And what we mean by nice set here is just that we want this limit to exist, okay? So we want, this, we want surface area to be well-defined for this set. Uh, and in that case, um, um, you know, so as long as the set is not too crazy, uh, if you fix the volume, then the surface area is minimized by the Euclidean ball, right? And, and this fact, the isoperimetric inequality, uh, uh, for those who might not have come across it before, it's, it's extremely important, not just in geometry, but in, but in physics and in, in many fields, right? It's the reason that soap bubbles are spherical, for example, because soap bubbles are trying to minimize surface tension, which is proportional to surface area. And therefore, and there's a fixed volume of air that is trapped inside the soap bubble. So, uh, so the brun minkowski inequality implies in a very natural way, the isoperimetric inequality. And I, uh, that's, that's a very simple observation actually to see, to see why that's the case. We can simply write, you know, we, we look at this, we look at this, um, definition um, and we simply you know just apply the brun minkowski inequality to this uh, and that gives us a lower bound right for this if you just blindly apply the brun minkowski inequality and then just some algebra immediately gives you uh, uh, what you want so would should i go through the algebra uh, Prakash, or so, sorry, I can't hear you. No, I think we can continue. It's it's 
with, without the algebra, no? Okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. So, so basically what you get here is just, uh, whatever with the, with the right volume. So, so, so anyway, so, um, uh, so there's there's analogs of these in this in this dictionary, and there's a there's a functional analog which I don't want to talk about because it'll take us too far afield. So the functional analog uh, is what is called the prekopa lindler inequality. But the probabilistic analog Um, is something that probably many people have seen, which is the entropy power inequality, right? And uh, that says that if X and Y are random vectors in Rn, uh, and they are independent, and we define the entropy power of X as Uh, then the entropy power of X plus Y is greater than or equal to the entropy power of X plus the entropy power of Y. Uh, and in fact, there's a nice equality condition too with equality if and only if X and Y are Gaussians with proportional covariances. Uh, so I'm ignoring one technical condition here. Um, okay, so um, so as as I suspect many people know, and if you don't know this, uh, uh, that's that's okay. So so this is uh, so so some remarks uh, uh, has been used. Uh, many times in proving coding theorems in proving converses or coding theorems in information theory uh, but 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 also this has various i mean sorry um, this also um, um, uh, I mean, connects to many other things. For example, it connects to the central limit theorem, right? So the, the connection to the central limit theorem comes from the fact that if we, if we now take uh, X and Y to be IID, uh, right? So it's, a, it's an elementary fact that if you look at the entropy of A times X for a positive real, well, for a real number A, then this is just the entropy of X plus log mod a so um so this implies that the entropy power of ax is just a squared times the entropy power of x and what that means is that in the iid case if you look at the entropy power of x plus y that's greater than or equal to twice the entropy power of x because these are iid and that's that's just another way of saying that the entropy power of x plus y over square root of two is bigger than or equal to the entropy power of x Right. So this is, in a sense, step one in the central limit theorem. So in, in the CLT, uh, we look at uh, these random variables, which are one over square root of n times the sum of the xi's. And uh, so, so, so what this inequality here says is that the entropy of S2 is bigger than or equal to the entropy of S1. Right, so this 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 follows from the EPI, and in fact, what turns out to be true, although it's harder to prove, is that the entropy of SN converges monotonically to the entropy of the of the appropriate uh, Gaussian. So, if well. 
uh, if the XIs are IID with mean zero and variance one. Right, and so this is this is closely related to the entropy power inequality, and it's one reason that the that the EPI is of interest not just in information theory but in probability, right? Um, uh, but there are also other reasons uh, that that it's of interest. Um, uh, for example, uh, it's uh, connected to I mean one can so this was observed by Stam that you know back in '69 that one can derive, for example, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for the Fourier transform. Uh, from the EPI. In fact, one can derive a strengthening of it. So, um, yeah. Um, anyway, so why is this? Uh, so, so what? Uh, so, so we've looked at two inequalities now: one from geometry and one from probability slash information theory, namely the brun minkowski inequality and the entropy power inequality. And analogies between these were noticed, you know, going back to Costa and Cover in the in the eighties. So Costa Cover, uh, I think eighty five or something like that, and and then Lieb. Uh, you know, so they noticed analogies uh, between the Brun Minkowski inequality and the and the entropy power inequality. So, you know, understanding this dictionary. And uh, you know, that leads to the natural question of is there a way to unify? Is there a sort of broader understanding? or unification uh, of these kinds of inequalities. So, um, well, uh, it turns out that there are several, so there are several ways of understanding several unifications. Um, so let's see, I'll mention a couple of these. Um, so one unification, um, um, uh, comes from, um, well, uh, comes from, comes from Young's inequality. I don't want to say too much, too much about this because this is well known. Young's inequality for convolution with sharp constant. So um, the so this is an inequality that goes back to to Braskamp and Lee, uh, actually to Be to Beckner um, in the seventies, uh, and he showed that if you look at Uh, indices like these, uh, you have this inequality between uh, the R norm of a convolution and the P norms uh, of uh, of the densities that you are convolving. So, so for you know this this holds for not you let's just look at densities f and g for densities f and g on rn uh, in that case this is to the power n and these 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 are some constants so cp squared is given by p to the one over p divided by p prime to the one over p prime So, so anyway, the details don't matter. The point is, this is a sharp inequality for the LR norm of a convolution given uh, LP and LQ norms of uh, F and G. And it turns out that because of the relationship between LP norms and Rennie entropies, this can be naturally written 
what this gives when you translate it to the Rennie entropy language um, is, you know, some lower bound. It gives you a lower bound uh, in, as some function of HP of X and HQ of Y. Right? And uh, in this, in this inequality, for example, you take PQR going to one, uh, you recover the EPI, and there's a, there's a corresponding inequality that's also true for, so this is reversed, the inequality is reversed if PQR are less than one. And so if you take PQR going to zero, you get the Brun-Minkowski inequality. So this is one possible unification, but it relies on this, um, you know, this, this analytic inequality, which, which is not very transparent on the face of it. It turns out that, that actually um, there is a way to make this inequality transparent using entropy, using uh, dualities with uh, entropy inequalities and so on, but that's going to take us too far afield, so I'm not going to go there. Um, but the, the second unification, um, is, uh, is one that I want to explain because it's not as well known and that's using rearrangements. So, uh, so, so there's, there's a, there's a, so, you know, so, so rearrangements are, uh, so this is a continuous version of, uh, you know, of sort of, the notion of majorization, if you like, that, that appears in you know, finite settings. Uh, but uh, the rearrangement of a, of, a, of a density or more generally a non-negative function uh, relies on the following um, uh, idea that if you look at a function f of x, one way to write that is to write it as the integral dt from zero to fx, right? which I can rewrite as the integral from zero to infinity of the indicator function, uh, you know, t less than fx dt, right? Uh, and yet another way to write that is to write this as the integral from zero to infinity of the indicator function of a sub t applied to x dt, where a sub t is the set of x in Rn such that f of x is bigger than t, right? So if I have some density, what this is saying is that you, you pick a particular t and then um, uh, you look at the set where f of x is bigger than t, right? So that's this set here. This is our a sub t. And then you integrate these indicator functions and that, that recovers F. So this is sometimes called the layer cake decomposition, right? Because it's like you're, you're slicing off a cake in layers and putting it back together to get the function. Um, so uh, the, the idea of rearrangements is basically to say, if you want to rearrange this, rearrange this function uh, in such a way that it's uh, that it's that it's nice, that it's symmetric in some fashion. One way to do that is to use the notion of rearrangements of sets. So, the rearrangement of a set of A is just a centered Euclidean ball with the same volume as A. Okay, so, so no matter how crazy your set is, um, as long as it has finite volume, its rearrangement is just a centered Euclidean ball, right, with the same volume. I'm sorry, my balls are horrible. Um, so, yeah, so whatever. Okay, so, um, uh, so, so, so the idea here is that just as we have this identity that this is this, integral of indicators. Um, so similarly, 
that leads to suggest defining f star x. This is the uh, what is called the spherically symmetric decreasing rearrangement. Uh, which is the integral from zero to infinity. Uh, okay, so the rearrangement of A is denoted A star. So, um, so, so this is the, you look at the indicator functions of AT star of X dt. Okay, so basically what we are doing is we are looking at this, at this layer cake decomposition here. And then every time we come across one of these sets AT, what we are doing is we are positioning it back at the origin. We are, and, and then we are building up, uh, you know, we are integrating these repositioned indicators. So what that ends up giving you is because these are now all indicators of balls, these AT stars are all Euclidean balls. So what that ends up giving us is a density that is spherically symmetric and decreasing, uh, radially decreasing, right? So, so starting, from, starting from any density, uh, what you what you end up getting is something that's um, that's uh, that's spherically symmetric and decreasing. Um, and moreover, so it's a it's a, it's sort of basic application of Fubini's theorem. So Fubini's theorem implies that. Um, uh, for example, all the LP norms of F star are preserved. I mean, all the LP norms of F are preserved by F star. Okay, so the rearrangements preserve all LP norms. And one consequence of this is that if you started out with a density, uh, then so is F star. Okay, also, if you started out with a density, then because the LP norms just translate nicely to Rennie entropies, uh, H alpha of F star is equal to H of F star, I mean H alpha of F uh, for all alpha and zero to infinity. Uh, Okay, so, um, uh, right, so. Um, I have more clear question, this Prakash. Yeah. So LP norms are preserved. Uh, the transformation from the left to the right, is it reversible in special cases? Uh, what do you mean? Can you get the, uh, the original function back? No. No, because this is very uh, non one to one, right? It's okay. uh, ma right. many, many different. Um, uh, yeah, I mean. There are no special cases where you can, uh, except for the, perhaps the trivial ones, the way you can recover things. Yeah, there's, in, in general, this is, this is extremely uh, degenerate, right? Okay. So. Um, there's a vast number of functions which will map to a given spherically symmetric decreasing function. Sure. Yeah. 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 So you'd have to have pretty restrictive assumptions to have some sort of, uh, you know, you'd have to look at a, an extremely restrictive class of densities in order to have some recoverability. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, so, 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 so anyway, so, um, uh, so, so the reason this is interesting is because here is an alternative alternative formulation of the Brun Minkowski inequality and the entropy power inequality. And this is also fairly well known, but let me uh, write it down anyway. So that is uh, so for the Brun Minkowski inequality, uh, the formulation is that. Um, the volume of A1 plus A2 is greater than or equal to the volume of B1 plus B2. Uh, or, you know what, easier way to write this. A1 star plus A2 star. 
that's it. Okay, so these are rearrangements. So these are basically Euclidean balls. So remember, A1 star, this is just a Euclidean ball with volume of A1 star equals volume of A1, right? That determines the Euclidean ball, centered. So it's centered at zero. So this is just the centered Euclidean ball with the, with the right volume. So the reason this is equivalent to the Brun-Minkowski inequality is because the Brun-Minkowski inequality holds to the equality for Euclidean balls. So basically what that means is that, you know, this, this inequality here is equivalent because of the equality condition, which is, which is trivial to check. It's trivial to check that, you know, the, that this inequality holds for Euclidean balls, right? Because radii, when you, when you add up two Euclidean balls, the radii add up and the volume behaves like the nth power of the radius for Euclidean balls. So that means that this is just the volume of A1 star plus the volume of A2 star. Uh, I'm sorry, volume of A1 star to the one over N plus the volume of A2 star to the one over N hold to the N, right? Because you're adding radii and radii behave like one over nth power of volume. But this is just the volume of A1 to the one over N plus the volume of A2 to the one over N because the volumes are preserved. And that's exactly the Brun-Minkowski inequality, right? So this is an equivalent formulation. And in an exactly analogous manner, there's an equivalent formulation of the EPI, which is that entropy power of X1 plus X2 is greater than or equal to the entropy power of Z1 plus Z2 uh, if ZI are, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to say isotropic Gaussians by which I just mean, by which I just mean mean zero and covariance that's a multiple of the identity. Covariance equals some, you know, covariance proportional to the identity matrix. Okay, uh, so, uh, so spherically symmetric Gaussians basically, uh, such that once you say that they are spherically symmetric Gaussians, all you need to specify is the entropy, for example, to determine the variance in each direction. So such that the entropy of ZI is equal to the entropy of XI or the entropy powers, it doesn't matter which way you write it. So, so if you match the entropies or the entropy powers, then um, you know, the, the entropy power of the sum is, is uh, bounded from below by the entropy power of the sum of the corresponding Gaussians, right? So this is, this, these look very similar, right? You can see the analogy here. Um, and so uh, it turns out that, that one way to understand these in a unified manner is the following. Uh, is this is this uh, analogy here clear? All right. So 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 what, one way to understand this is the following. So this is the uh, EPI rearrangement version. Uh, and this is in a paper of Wang and myself from 2014 in the transactions. Uh, and it says that for any alpha uh, in zero to infinity, actually you can include um, uh, n alpha of x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to n alpha of x1 star plus x2 star. where um, if Xi has density Fi, then Xi star are just, so, so of course Xi's are independent. Uh, Xi stars just have these rearranged densities and are independent. Okay, so in other words, if we, if we find the spherically symmetric decreasing rearrangement of the densities, right? Those are densities as well of very nice symmetric random vectors. Um, then, uh, you know, that gives us a lower bound. And in particular, if you now consider, so, um, right, so, so remarks, if you now consider alpha equals zero, right, this, this immediately gives us that, that N zero or equivalently H zero, right? It doesn't matter if you write, um, sorry. Uh, it doesn't matter if you write um, uh, N or H. So 
So H zero of X one plus X two. Well, well, in the alpha equals zero case, the 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 Rennie entropy of order zero is just the log of the volume of the support. So so basically, this reduces to volume of A one plus A two is greater than or equal to volume of A one star plus A two star, which is exactly the Brun Minkowski inequality. Right, because it's uh, it's trivial to see that if that if x i is supported on a i, then x i star is supported on a i star. Right. So you can take, for example, the x i to be the uniform on a i. Okay. So, uh, so, so this this immediately gives you the Brun Minkowski inequality as an outcome of this. This this can be thought of as a Rennie EPI, right? Oops. So, uh, so, so this is this is a kind of Rennie entropy power inequality, and it gives, in particular, the Brun Minkowski inequality. And on the other hand, if you take alpha equals one, it tells us that the that the uh, that the um, well. It tells us that the entropy power of x1 plus x2 is bigger than or equal to the entropy power of x1 star plus x2 star. Now, this is not the same. This is not the usual EPI, but it's actually an improvement of the usual EPI because the usual EPI itself tells us that this in turn has to be greater than or equal to the entropy power of z1 plus z2. Right? Remember that. Remember that the rearrangements preserve entropy. So what that means is that the you know entropy of x i is equal to the entropy of x i star, and that's also equal to the entropy of z i, because the way we picked the Gaussians was to match the entropies, right? So 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 this inequality here follows from the EPI itself. Okay. So you might say this is circular. This is not really an alternative way of getting the usual EPI because we are using the EPI to see that this is an improvement of the EPI, right? To see that this bound is sharper than the usual EPI. Uh, but but in fact, it turns out, and we show that in the same paper that that starting from this inequality here, you can also recover the entropy power inequality. The details are a bit. Uh, Involved, but it's possible to recover the the, the usual EPI uh, from this rearrangement version because what this rearrangement version is saying is basically that you don't need to prove the EPI for general densities anymore. You just need to prove it for spherically symmetric decreasing ones. So you've simplified your problem, right? And so so I haven't. I mean, one I, I haven't seen applications of this inequality in information theory, but I would be very curious. You know, I wonder there there ought to be some because this is saying that for any uh, Rennie entropy of any order, if you are looking at convolutions or sums of random variables, it's sufficient to consider spherically symmetric decreasing densities. You don't need to worry about dealing with arbitrary densities. So you're really reducing the simplicity, the the complexity of your problem. Um, so so anyway, I'd be curious to know if you know if. Uh, if this has other applications in in information theory, but uh, but in any case, this is one way of unifying uh, these inequalities. But in fact, it can give us more because, of course, you know, alpha equals zero and alpha equals one are just two particular cases. This is an inequality that holds for all alpha. So um, uh, uh, you know, of course, one can consider general alpha, but the third particularly interesting case of alpha is is uh, is alpha equals infinity and in that case uh uh what is this saying this is saying something about the maximum of the densities right so if you look at n infinity right this is saying something so remember that h infinity of x is minus log of the infinity norm uh, of the density, right? So, um, so if we call if we call m of x, if I write this for the infinity norm of f, okay, 
or you know if we assume that this is the essential supremum but if we assume that the density is continuous for instance then this is the this is the maximum right if the if the density is continuous um uh well okay so yeah let me not mess things up so so it's the essential supremum right so then this is basically saying that the maximum of the density if you look at maximum of the density then this is less than or equal to what you would get if you looked at euclidean balls uh, i mean if you looked at the rearrangements all right so why is this interesting it's interesting because these maximums of densities are of significant interest in probability theory so um so let me explain why that's the case um so there's this whole area of probability which is called small ball theory small ball estimates in probability theory um um so let me let me start by explaining this in the discrete setting and then i can go back to the continuous setting so i mean everything everything that i've talked about here um one can you know ask these questions so so just a just an aside before i get into small ball estimates so so uh, all these questions you know so so you know what i've been talking about uh, for the for the last half hour has been you know looking at looking at uh uh entropies or entropy powers h alpha of x plus y right uh how is this uh you know, bounds in terms of uh something to do with the distributions of x and y right so um so so any such phenomenon can be studied so the general setting for for such questions you know so far we were looking at rn but the general setting for such questions all you need is some nice addition operation right so so it's just a group is uh, is a group oops um sorry it looks like my my apple pencil has died i need to charge it for a second uh so all right so so sorry no okay so so you can look at a group g and the the main thing that you need for the group is you need it to be locally compact uh you know and some topological assumptions like hausdorff and so on because what that implies is that you have a hard measure on the group which is just a translation invariant measure right so so lebesgue measure is hard measure for the for euclidean space and uh you know counting measure is hard measure for a finite group so 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 basically this in this general setting you can ask so in particular so examples would be uh you know any finite group or any countable group more generally uh or the integers you know of course rn etc you can also look at non abelian settings but but these are already difficult enough so you can ask these questions for any of these settings and of course these questions have been studied for all of these settings so for now uh let's consider uh, so to explain what small ball estimates are let's consider the case of the of the integers okay so so here is an inequality due to littlewood and offord and this goes to the 40s and um uh, they observed the following so if you look at uh, bernoulli random variables so so let's say um xi or bernoulli half random variables iid uh and uh so 
uh, right. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to look at the sum of AI XI, okay? And what they were interested in was the maximal atom, okay? So the question was, what is the maximal probability that this takes any particular value? You want to maximize over X, I going from one to N, let's say, and they were looking for bounds on this, okay? So, so for, uh, for arbitrary A1 to AN, let's say positive, okay? Uh, what bounds can one find on this? And what Littlewood and Offert proved was that uh, this is of order log N over square root of N. Okay, so, so I mean, the reason they were interested, so, so these, these kinds of problems are important in physics. So for example, they come up in random matrix theory because these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking for these maximal atoms and so on are related to things like finding the probability that a random matrix is singular and so on. So, so these kinds of questions, you know, so, so these kinds of questions have applications for example, in random matrix theory, but in other areas as well. And uh, subsequently, uh, Erdős in, uh, uh, in uh, I don't remember, I think it was the 60s, if I remember right, uh, came up with this um, refinement of this, where he observed that actually you can identify, so, so let's, let's call this something, let's call this um, L of A, Okay, so, so A is just A1 to AN, right? For A equals A1 to AN, it's that, that vector. And L of A is the maximal atom of this linear combination of Bernoulli, right? So what Erdős noticed was that this L of A is less than or equal to L of the vector 1, 1, 1, 1. In other words, the, you get the largest maximal atom. I mean, you're interested in varying these, these coefficients AI, but the, you get the largest maximal atom and all the coefficients are the same. And in that case, it's clear what the sum of the XI is, right? The XIs are Bernoulli half. So in this case, this is just the maximal atom of the Bernoulli distribution. So this is just the maximal atom of, uh, of the Bernoulli, I mean, of the binomial distribution, binomial N half, right? Which, uh, which we know is just uh, n choose n over two divided by two to the n. That's going to be the maximal atom, the, the sort of central atom of the binomial distribution, right? Because this is uh, because, of, uh, because of the half. So it's the central atom. Uh, and this, it's very easy to see that this is order one over square root of n. So this improves the bound of Littlewood and Offert. Uh, so, so this is an this is an this is an extremely influential uh, result, and it's the beginning of small ball theory, if you like. Um, uh, and I mean, more generally, the, these can be thought of as somehow anti-concentration bounds, right? So, so concentration of measure is something that uh, that you know that probably many people have come across, but this is a sort of anti-concentration bound because it's saying that any linear combination of Bernoulli's cannot be too concentrated, right? The maximal atom is smaller than something, right? So, so the, you have a sort of universal bound on the maximal atom, on maximal atom, which is saying that, that this is anti-concentrated in some sense. Uh, it's spread out. Right, so, so sums of Bernoulli's, linear combinations of Bernoulli's are reasonably spread out in this sense that the maximal atom is of order one over square root of n. And um, then, you know, there are many variants of these kinds of questions, um, uh, which, which I don't want to get into, but, but, you know, you can also ask these questions in the continuous setting. And in the continuous setting, of course, it no longer makes sense to talk about the maximal atom but what you can talk about, so in the continuous setting, uh, uh, what you can talk about is you can talk about the maximum of the density, for instance, or more generally about the probability of small balls, 
So you can either look at, you know, the, the max of the density, right? Or you can look at the max over, let's say, uh, uh, R of the probability that X lies in some ball uh, of, uh, uh, well, max over X, it lies in some ball of radius epsilon around X for fixed epsilon or some small fixed epsilon. Right, so this is why it's called small ball probabilities, right? Small ball estimates, because you want to get bounds on this probability of lying in a small ball. And this is a reasonable proxy for that. I mean, it's often a first step to getting small ball estimates is to get an estimate on the maximum of the density. So um, uh, the reason I mentioned this is because one immediate consequence of this rearrangement estimate that I talked about here, remember we had this general rearrangement version of the EPI, which in particular in the alpha equals infinity case gave us this, uh, this thing here, right? That the, uh, that the maximum density is bounded from above by the maximum density when you uh, convolve the rearranged densities, right? So, so that one immediate implication of that is that we get an, um, a version of the EPI for the infinity Rennie entropy. So this, you can think of this as an infinity EPI. Um, and that says that, um, uh, that if you look, if Xi are independent random vectors, are independent uh, random vectors, then the uh, M of the sum of the Xi Uh, is less than or equal to m, or if you're looking at n infinity, it's going to be the other way, right? So I'm not going to bother writing that. Um, is less than or equal to the sum m of the sum of the ui, where the uis are uh, uniforms on Euclidean balls. Uh, such that uh, independent, of course, independent uniforms on Euclidean balls, such that um, uh, such that m of xi is equal to m of ui. Okay, so this is a precise sort of infinity analog of the EPI and the Brun-Minkowski inequality, right? And it's new. This is a this is a generalization of an inequality of Rogozin in one dimension. Um, so, so this is Rogozin's generalization of Rogozin's inequality, which goes back to the 70s or something. Um, and this was developed uh, in a paper with uh, James Melbourne and Peng Shu in, I don't know, 2017. Uh, and uh, I mean, as an as an immediate, there are there are other consequences of this. I mean, uh, for for example, you can write down, uh, you know, uh, explicit. Uh, I'm I'm not going to write it down because it's complicated. But uh, but as an explicit function of the n infinity of x i, you can write down a bound, um, and uh, you know, and and this this these this, this is sharp in some sense. So it's it's not. This is to to get these bounds is not not trivial actually. There's a fair bit of geometry involved, but um, but but nonetheless, one one has this infinity version of the uh, EPI. So so there are um, so I think I'm running out of time. So there's there's a lot more that can be said. I mean, for example, um, one thing that can be done is that. Uh, this this same idea. There's there's a version of this rearrangement story, these rearrangement EPIs that also hold in the discrete setting. For example, in the integers, and uh, that is developed in work with uh, so for 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 rearrangement EPIs on the integers. Um, there's uh, a couple of papers with. Uh, Leah Wang and with J O Wu, uh, I don't know, uh, 
they're they're all on the archive. I don't remember the when they were put up, but um, but these basically give analogous inequalities on the integers. It's a little trickier in the integers because you can't do rearrangements in the same way. There's, there's it gets more complicated, but nonetheless, you can recover, uh, you can unify on the one hand inequalities from additive combinatorics, which basically are the, uh, you know, is the set, the alpha equals zero when you're looking at cardinalities of sets instead of volumes of sets in the continuous settings. Uh, you can unify that with this Littlewood offered Erdős inequality that we just talked about. You get you get this Littlewood offered Erdős inequality as an as an easy consequence of this um, of these rearrangement EPIs on the integers, and in fact generalizations of it. And uh, you also get uh, uh, some kind of uh, you know Shannon EPI on the integers as a as a consequence of it. So. Um, uh, so, so, so anyway, so, so, um, uh, and there's, there are many open questions. For example, uh, uh, if you look at the integers, we still don't know the following. Uh, we still don't know the following. We still don't know optimal estimates for the entropy of X plus Y in terms of the entropy of X and entropy of Y. Unknown, you know, find a function which gives you a sharp estimate, right? This is, this is unknown. This is open. Um, for x, y, and the integers, independent. Um, anyway, so um, uh, I think I should probably stop here since it's one, but I'm happy to take questions. Uh, Moksha, there's a question that came in from one of the participants. If you scroll up to the, to, to the screen, to the slide, uh, the yeah. question is, let me read it. The maximum on the right, is it with respect to x or is x fixed and the maximum with respect to the probability measure that's the question ah uh, so okay so um no so the you're, you're looking at the maximum over x so you can ask this question for different kinds of random variables and uh in this uh, uh um so I mean, so, so there's this, this area of small ball estimates is actually quite huge. I mean, for example, it's of great interest in statistics because uh, the small ball estimates for infinite dimensional, uh, so basically for stochastic processes like Brownian motion and you know, various kinds of Gaussian processes and so on uh, are, are important in uh, you know, getting uh, sort of minimax risk bounds in, in non-parametric statistics and so on. And uh, so, um, uh, uh, so, so uh, I actually, in, more for Bayesian. So for Bayesian non-parametric statistics, they're 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 useful. So, um, so, so in those situations, you know, you're looking at a fixed, at a fixed x. Your your x is some you know, random variable in some Banach space or something. And you know, this ball is some ball in a Banach space. And you're looking at you know the maximal probability of lying in a small ball for some fixed uh, distribution, right? Which is some infinite dimensional thing. Um, but even in these finite dimensional settings, I mean, uh, the the question is already of interest for specific distributions. But but you know uh, if you know for it depends on the application. So for example, in the Littlewood offered setting for these random matrix applications one is interested in varying the distribution over these linear combinations of Bernoulli's. And you can do the same thing in the continuous setting too. You can look at you know, linear combinations of random variables given some constraints and you can ask you know, what is, for example, the maximal small ball probability over, the class of dis over a certain class of distributions. And um, you know, so, so that, that is something that, you can, uh, that, that is of interest as well. Uh, but but this is the sort of primitive. The primitive is you look at it for a fixed distributions, and then for certain applications, it may be of interest to also maximize over a class of distributions, as we did for the Littlewood offered or this uh, situation. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? Let me see this. Any questions? So Moksha, as expected. Uh, we were treated to a tour de force. Thank you very much. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, people writing to you, including me, uh, for further discussion. So once again, we thank you. This was 
uh, a fascinating seminar. And for me personally, a lot to learn. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.